welcome this morning to worship with the Evans Park Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're here. There are many announcements. We, we are busy people, which is a good thing in some ways, but we also understand you can't be everywhere you may want to be. So this morning we are going to try to uh, be our best to stay on a good schedule so we can engage in as much as we like to. So after worship this morning, there is a worship and music committee meeting. I also know that our confirmation student has a meeting. I also know that there's fellowship with refreshments. And hopefully we wrap all those things up so that at noon, those who want to play bingo can join in bingo, and those who are in choir can go to choir rehearsal. And then maybe when the choir is finished, they can still come and join us for bingo. So a lot of back and forth. We'll, we'll try all those logistics this morning with all that we have going on in the life of the church. Um, there is a calendar in our worship bulletin with special other events that are coming up this week. But I also want to allow anyone who had to speak to any of those events to do so. Does anyone have any announcements regarding anything in the week ahead? Um, just um, about the key natures, uh, asking for uh, monetary donations mm -hmm. for the Whosoever Gospel Mission bags. Um, as of this week, uh, we went and we purchased in bulk, which saved us a great deal of money, but we would still appreciate any monetary uh, donations that anyone could give. Um, and we uh, managed to uh, get all the supplies that we wanted to put into the bags. Uh, so anything we can reimburse our checking account with would be most appreciated. Wonderful. So the teenagers are creating 55 hygiene bags for their residents at the Whosoever Gospel Mission. So as Jenny mentioned, they kind of purchase that ahead of time so each bag matches whatever is needed, toothbrush, hairbrush, etc. But if you're able to make a monetary, monetary donation to teenagers to help offset those costs, that would be appreciated. Looking ahead to next Sunday, Amy, you want to speak to Super Bowl? Uh, yes. Perfect. Don't forget next Sunday is the Super Bowl and it's also our team, SOUP, Super Bowl. <laughs> so just remember that we're going to have a cauldron or whatever you want to call it. Or Cauldron's a cool word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so bring your uh, bring some food for Bits and Hunger, and we're going to benefit the food pantry at Fox Chase Memorial. So uh, just remember that for next week. Thank you. Yes, we take monetary donations into the cauldron or soup pot Sunday, <laughs> <laughs> and then we're able to. Uh, allow Fox Chase to use the money to ensure that the exact items they actually need are purchased rather than things that maybe are not purchased uh, or necessary for the pantry. So that will be next Sunday. And you may hear of other churches doing that because that is a nationwide um, opportunity that was started by a Presbyterian church youth group about 30 years ago. So what a gift that it has grown to be now be a nationwide activity that includes churches that aren't even Presbyterian anymore. Um, also looking ahead, the teenagers are going out to lunch on Thursday, correct? So if you want to join them for bon Bonnet Lane at noon on Thursday, let Elaine or Jenny or Jean or someone know about that. And then you can look ahead and see what our plans are beyond the week on the calendar. So keep an eye out for newsletter announcements and other things that are happening to ensure that you are in the loop on everything. And that's probably all we need to cover. Oh, and there's Bible study Tuesday morning at 1015. <coughs> We'd love to have you join us for that as well. Tomorrow I'll be at the Protestant home um, doing my usual monthly commitment, but also leading a worship service in the area called Pathways, which is where our member Jerry Diebold resides now. The uh, Protestant home is going through a chaplain transition, so until March 1st when their new, two new chaplains they hired arrived, those of us who already go are kind of tacking on an extra activity to fill the gaps. So I'll be there all morning tomorrow if you want to pop in at some point and find me uh, for multiple services. Being that it is the first Sunday of the month, we want to invite you to greet one another. So if you'd like to rise and share with each other the peace of Christ this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. responsibly in our call to worship. May we open our hearts and minds to God's word, 
May our hearts be filled with the humility we need to hear and receive the message today. As we worship together, may our praise be pleasing to God, and our fellowship bring joy to one another in the name of Christ. Let us pray. This morning, God, we ask that your spirit be present in this time of worship. Allow us in our praise and prayer and reflection on scripture to be better equipped to be disciples of Jesus Christ, those who share the good news of salvation and who open our own hearts up to your grace. Guide us now in this time not only to be filled with praise, but to be filled with the wonder and awe of being in the presence of faithful servants who serve you and who serve alongside us in this amazing ministry you've called us all to. We ask this giving thanks in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> So please join me together in one voice of prayer. Gracious God, it's tempting to give up and give in, to hide from the injustices of the world, to protect ourselves and our own, to turn off the evening news full of bad news, forgive our sins of escape, of ignoring, of turning our backs on those in need, forgive our sins of apathy when you call us to action, Renew us, holy God, by your grace. Strengthen us to follow Christ's call. Hear us now and offer us your abundant grace. steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Know that you are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ and be at peace. Thank you, God. I invite you this morning to join me as we affirm our faith using the familiar words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic 
Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we join together in our praise songs. songs of scripture, I invite you to responsibly lift up the words of Psalm 147 with me. 
Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praise to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Praise our Lord, my mighty power, the understanding of that As we are in awe of God's great understanding of each one of us as individuals, as well as the entirety of humanity across time and place, we come before God with humility and awe. Before we turn to our scripture reading this morning, please first join me in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and creating God, we come before you with great humility and awe. We come before you admitting that we do not have full understanding of your awesome power and your great love and your willingness to forgive each and every one of us and all people who you call your children. We are grateful for the words of scripture, for the amazing welcome in Christ for all people to know Jesus Christ not only as their Lord and Savior, to know God as creator of all, to recognize the human dignity in each person, and to open our hearts up to the gift of the Holy Spirit upon all who believe, so that we may, in turn, show your grace and love to others. Guide us now as we open scripture to better understand the Great Commission, the call to baptize believers to the ends of the earth, and guide us to better reconcile with our own unwillingness, the challenges and fears and anxieties we have, the doubts that we carry, free us from the burdens that hold us back in the sharing of the good news of salvation. Guide us now as we open scripture to hear you speak. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. So this morning we are going to look to the words of the great apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which appears on page 1134 in our Pew Bible. We're going to begin with verse 19, and here are these words that Paul writes to the early church, to the church in Corinth, a church that's in its first generation of figuring out what it is to be a gathered group of Christians, not only dealing with and wrestling with what it is to be a church and getting to know one another and conduct worship and things together, but then to process how Paul has witnessed to them what it is to be evangelical or to reach out with the good news to others. So Paul is wrestling with his own identity and, of course, responding to concerns about how can we tell people about God and about God revealed in Jesus Christ if we're still wrestling with our own identity as disciples of Jesus. So here are these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. So as Paul writes this, and all of his letters, we would assume he is writing in response to a question or a concern or some sort of outreach from the congregation. So the Corinthian congregation has undoubtedly kind of shared some sort of their own anxieties or fear that I think is shared by each one of us as a follower of Christ, of how do I share the gospel with others, especially with people who maybe aren't like me or who are already disagreeable to me or maybe who I just don't like interacting with. <laughs> so this great commission, this call upon every Christian is to share the gospel to the ends of the earth well, sometimes at the end of the block is uncomfortable. So how do I deal with this? And I can imagine the wrestling in the early church of feeling inadequate or feeling that they had failed because in one generation, the gospel had yet to reach the ends of the earth. The immediacy of the gospel is not lost on Paul. 
Paul has this urgency throughout his entire ministry as an apostle to realize that he believes at any moment Jesus could return. And this fear of inadequacy of have I done enough before Jesus does return to be considered a good and faithful servant, one who has fulfilled this great commission to share the good news to the ends of the earth, when I realize how very difficult that is. Now, in the time of Paul and the First Corinthian congregation being founded, Christianity is new not only to the world and to those who might be encountering the good news, but Christianity is new even to Christians who are still figuring out what it is to be a member of a congregation. Before the vocabulary that we're traditionally using, before this understanding of ruling elders and deacons and pastors, before the understanding of a formal church, they're just really gathering basically in people's homes or outdoors or in the synagogue where they were familiar to gathering in the past, and they're figuring out what it is to follow Jesus, to share the stories authentically, to interact with people who were, thankfully, eyewitnesses to Jesus' earthly ministry, but also wrestling with the reality that very soon the population who really met Jesus in the flesh is going to dwindle as those people get older and pass on. So how does the church continue? And Paul presents this very real rebuttal to this doubt or question of are we doing enough to share the gospel? Because in addition to sharing the gospel, we're trying to convene church services for the first time. We're trying to figure out what liturgy and worship and communion and baptism all look like. We're trying to figure out which one of us are called to lead and how their gifts could be used and what title those leaders get. Oh yeah, we have daily lives and spouses and children and businesses to run, and your life has happened amongst all of this. So are we doing it well enough? Is probably the plea coming from the Corinthians. Are we being church in a way that is good enough to continue to have the honorable title of followers of Jesus, as disciples of our Lord? It's not so much a concern of are we doing it right, because I have the instructions of what right looks like. Right looks like love God and love others and tell them to do the same. They know the directions. It's just the very real logistics of can we accomplish that? Can we tell people the good news? live lives that are honorable, be obedient to God, and still be in this world with all the multitude of infinite of other demands placed upon us as individuals, as households, as a community, and now as a faith entity. Can we do that? Because we want to do it well. So it's nice to know that they want to do it well. They don't want to skimp and kind of coast through and just get by on the edges. They want to be honorable in fulfilling this call, this great commission that Jesus gave his disciples and you and I and every disciple since. So Paul explains to them how he thinks he is living into it. He admits it's hard and it's a struggle. He said, but this is how I have lived into it. This is the best way, the best approach I have found so far. He said, when I encounter someone, I do my best to be approachable and likable. He said, that's how I figured out how to be successful. I figured out that if you meet people and you are pleasant to them and you get to know what they love to do and what interests them and you find affinity with them in doing those things with them, then they'll be more likely to be receptive to the good news. So Paul doesn't say, I like to walk up to people immediately, hit them in the head with the Bible and say, are you going to hell or heaven? He says, this isn't going to work. He doesn't go and say, you know what, I went in a parking lot at the Walmart and I put a track in everyone's windshield. And when they come back to their car, they're immediately going to find that, not be annoyed that it's there, not litter it. They're going to read it and be saved at that moment. He doesn't say, I knock on people's doors and harass them. He doesn't say, I call them. He doesn't say that my own relatives, if they're not living up to Jesus, that I berate them and judge them and tell them they're wrong and I'm right. He doesn't use any of those examples. He says, the way I've figured this out, now he's new to figuring it out too, he said, the best approach that I've seen the most outcome and success from is by meeting people where they are and affirming where they are and going along with them in what they already enjoy doing. He said, the result is not that everyone I encounter comes to Jesus. He said, the result is that some of them do. This has been the approach, Paul says, that has led to some success, not universal success. Not every single person dropped me to their knees and asked me to be baptized 10 minutes after meeting Paul. He said, but some of the people I interact with 
respond with a willingness and an affirmation and a curiosity that then leads to them coming to know Christ as Savior. So he judges that as success, that some of them respond affirmatively. So he says, when I'm with Jewish people, I act Jewish. I eat what they're eating. I behave like they're behaving. If it's a Sabbath, I treat it like a Sabbath. If the food's presented before me is kosher, I eat it without complaint. If they expect me to do a high holy day ritual, I go with them to do it. Let's get off my back. I'm not Jewish anymore, Paul says, but if that makes it agreeable and friendly, I engage in that way. He says, when I interact with people who are very fastidious and obedient to the law, in their presence, I follow that law. He said, when I'm with people, though, who don't follow the law, I don't browbeat them about the way they should follow the law. I just live the way they're living. He says, I always honor God. I don't do anything heretical. I don't break the laws of the community I'm in unnecessarily, but within reason. When I'm with people, I behave like them, talk like them, eat like them, dress like them, and go about my day like them so that I'm approachable and authentic and relatable. And when the opportunity presents itself, I can then share the gospel. And some of them respond appropriately. Now, this is just kind of human dignity and respect and interaction. Martha and I were musing recently that she read an article about people teaching other people not to be a jerk. That there had to be an article written in 2024 to tell people, this is how human decency is, and we're going to write a letter and publish it. So that it wasn't a religious article, but just maybe you shouldn't be a jerk all the time. That's basically what Paul is saying. So the example that Martha gave me from the article she read was, if you enter someone's home and all of the sneakers are set by the front door, they take their shoes off, you should take your shoes off too. Even in your house, if you wear your shoes up and you lay them in bed, and you wear them in the shower, you wear them everywhere, in this person's house, clearly they take their shoes off. So don't be a jerk. You're a guest. Take your shoes off. Very simple. It doesn't change your life or impede your life at all. It's different than how you live. But honor the standards where you are, and then you will be a welcome guest rather than an unpleasant visitor. And Paul says, that's what I'm going to do. But 2,000 years later, we're still having to teach people articles of etiquette. You just need to be approachable and respectable and show dignity to people, or else they're not going to give you the time of day. They're not going to enter into a relationship with you, whether that be business or social or otherwise. Do not set up unnecessary barriers to interaction. So if your goal is commerce, or your goal is education, or your goal is relationship, or your goal is neighborliness, whatever your goal may be, just to find some friends, you're not going to go in and make yourself as unapproachable and bristly as possible. You're probably going to have yourself a little bit subdued, work the room and figure out kind of the mood and what's going on, and make yourself accommodating of that. So we know how to do that when we go to an office party. We know how to do that when we go to a town council meeting. We know how to do that when we're out in public and we're in line at the grocery store. We know how to kind of acclimate to the majority of the mood and behavior around us so that we don't stick out like a sore thumb. But in the time of Paul in this letter being written and today, we somehow then forget how to do that when we're talking about Jesus. We become incredibly awkward and incredibly unapproachable and bristly like a porcupine as soon as it enters our mind, well, maybe I'll tell someone about Jesus. And Paul recognizes this problem, that for some reason, maybe as our own doubts or our feelings of inadequacy, we are not Jesus, so how can we do this ourselves? When we approach others in our faith, we often become tongue-tied or awkward or a little bit standoffish. And so in response to this, there was a popular movement in the last two decades called friendship evangelism. And books have been written celebrating it, and books also have been written discrediting it. But it's basically the general talk, teaching is, if you're already friendly with someone, if you already know how to make friends, the issue isn't your faith. You have the skills of interpersonal communication. You know how to stand in a line at the grocery store and make chit-chat with the person behind you and in front of you. You know how if you're in the stands of a soccer game and your grandkids running around playing soccer, you know how to talk to the other moms and dads around you. You know how in the waiting room at a doctor's appointment how to make chit-chat with the staff and other people. We all have those skills. So if we can do that and find commonality about a favorite restaurant or a song on the radio or even chit-chatting about how we're all mad about the traffic outside, why can't we then also, with those same social skills, 
occasionally, not every interaction, but occasionally bring up a discussion about faith. So friendship evangelism was courses that churches taught to help instruct people to take away that kind of social awkwardness and to occasionally, amongst people who already had a rapport with you, say things like, I went to a soccer game yesterday for my nephew. I went to a really great Chinese food restaurant that had the best egg rolls. I think you should eat there too. And you know what? On Sunday, I'll be at Bible study. And then just continue the conversation. To drop that in along with every other normal event and encounter in your life, because it isn't an awkward, unshareable thing. It should be just as simple to share as a soccer game or a restaurant review. And then test the waters and see if the person asks you a question back. The person might say, oh, soccer, I love soccer. And the conversation goes that way. The person might say, egg rolls, oh, I can't have egg rolls because I'm gluten intolerant. Let's talk about my gluten intolerance. And the conversation goes that way. Or the person might say, Bible study, what's that? So you've offered three options of discussion, as any friend would, and you wouldn't snap back at someone and say, egg rolls, I don't want to talk about egg rolls, I only want to talk about soccer. You know, you would say, okay, whatever topic now is approachable and comfortable, let's talk more about it. And it's kind of that already the skill you have, but embracing it and using it for evangelism or sharing the good news. I've become a fan when I'm alone in the car recently of listening to the Billy Graham station on my Sirius car radio. It is wonderful. I don't know if any of you actually have access to Sirius XM or a similar thing, but there's a whole station that's just Billy Graham sermons over and over again. Thankfully, my daughter doesn't have to listen to it when she's in the car with me. When I'm alone, I do it. And it's a good kind of way to just remind yourself of this amazing prophetic teacher and leader in the church. But in between, there are little promotions for what the Billy Graham Evangelical Association is doing. What they're doing in disaster response, education, their partnership with Samaritan's Purse, which we support through Operation Christmas Child. And recently, they lifted up the statistics, which is very apropos for what I was going to preach about, that if you poll people who come to Christ as an adult, people who come to be church members and adherents to the Christian faith in adulthood, 80% of them will tell you they came because a close friend who they trusted invited them to something in the life of the church. So 80% of people who come to Jesus don't just voluntarily wake up one day and say, oh, a church on the street, I'm just going to go anonymously and figure this out. It says 80% of people who come to know the Lord as an adult come because a friend who they trusted and had an existing relationship with shared socially the invitation to say, I happen to attend church. Would you like to come to a supper? or a social event, or a mission endeavor, or even worship, and their response was positive. We all know people who are all very friendly, and most of you in this room know more people than I do, and we have the joke basically, like everyone I bump into knows somebody from this church, so you have amazing social connections. Some of them are recent acquaintances, some of them are kind of neighbors by happenstance that you cross paths with. Some of them are decades-long, deep-seated relationships you have. And we've acknowledged that many of those people you have friendships with are already followers of Christ and worship somewhere, either here or somewhere else. And we affirm that and celebrate that. But I'm 100% sure you know at least one person who doesn't, who you have a rapport and a relationship with and already talk with about many things in life like sports, or food, or grandchildren, or the weather, or a million of other topics. So the invitation that Paul offers is when you're with these people, and you already have an acknowledgement and an understanding of what they prefer, how they behave, how they interact, and you're already making those accommodations to be in their presence, and you gain that genuine, authentic relationship that did start in a place of genuine friendship, not of ulterior motive. Now, as a follower of Christ, what would it look like occasionally you shared your faith. And again, not in a browbeating, judgmental way, but in the simple invitation of, I'm making an Operation Christmas Child shoe box. Have you ever heard of that? Do you want to see what goes in the box? Do you understand where these children are going to get this? Do you know that next Sunday, Super Bowl Sunday? Not only the football game, but Super S-O-U-P-E-R. Have you heard about that? You know, many local agencies do that. Churches and mission groups and youth groups. I'm going to be supporting a local food pantry. Can I tell you more about that? That's different than saying, are you going to heaven? <laughs> the conversation may at some point get there, but it starts in this place of genuine relationship. And Paul acknowledges that it's not fake. It's not an ulterior motive. Paul really wants to be friends with every kind of person. 
Because Paul understands that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, and the invitation is for all people, that all people are made in the image of God and deserve dignity and respect. And that each person he interacts with not only is hearing the gospel invitation from him, but he is receiving love and grace and witness from every person he interacts with because every person is a reflection of God's goodness. So he is open to the fact that this is a two-way interaction. That not only is he sharing his life and witness and faith as people are willing to receive it, but he is also receiving amazing public witness back to him as God is showing genuine love and grace in those interactions. Paul said, I can be anybody to anybody else. I'm versatile. We are all much more versatile than we give ourselves credit for. I know in my household it's been said that I have a mom voice, a wife voice, a pastor voice, on the phone with my parents voice, and a back of the ambulance with a disorderly patient voice. You don't want the wrong voice at the wrong time. That would be inappropriate and unpleasant, but in the right place at the right time, those voices make sense. Each one of you, if you ask people who are close to you, would say the same thing. That you have versatile voices and maybe multiple identities. You have a work persona and a home persona. You have a persona when you're the aunt, the mom, the uncle in a relationship versus the spouse or the child in a relationship. You have a different decorum when you're in the presence of your boss versus your coworkers. But none of us would ever say that we are a charlatan or we're lying or we're making up these false presentations of ourselves. We would say they're all contextually appropriate. So Paul says you need to be contextually appropriate to be somewhat successful in evangelism. And he has said, this is the best method I've come up with. Everything else I tried failed. Therefore, I've left myself in this contextual relationship place and saying, this has led to the most success, but still not universal success. So Paul admits that only some of the people he interacts with come to know the Lord. But that's better than none coming to know the Lord. And it takes his purposeful awareness of his context, of the people he is with, of listening and participating approachably and appropriately, of not purposely offending or having a roadblock in front of someone, and not betraying his own identity, but taking the parts of his identity that best mix with and match up with the context and the people he is with. So I would encourage you, if you'd like to, to kind of Google friendship evangelism and just realize how approachable and easy it can be. And then to be prayerful about who in your life maybe needs to hear about your faith who already knows about your grandkids or about your dog or about your vacation, someone you already interact with, someone who already has a desire to know more about your life. <coughs> and what if the next time you interacted with them, in addition to those kind of day-to-day -day realities, you share with them some testimony about your prayer life, about study of scripture, about your relationships with people in the congregation, about ways you engage in mission or outreach or fellowship, or about the fact that you just really enjoy coming to church and being with the people of God. Amen. church locally and abroad through missionaries through our staff and facilities and programs through all that we offer in response to God's call to serve in ways that show humility and awe and wonder for what God has given us already so I want to thank you for your willingness to share out of your own treasures and time and gifts with this congregation in a multitude of ways to bless us and to ensure that we can continue into the future to share the good news of salvation please join me in prayer Creator God, we ask your blessing upon all the gifts we have, our time, our talents, our treasure, our energy, our testimony, our imagination, 
Allow us to continue to use these gifts in ways that honor you and allow us to understand what abundance we have from you so that we can truly face the world in a way that shows that you are our provider and sustainer. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Today, we invite you to come forward to the center aisle and come to the table and take the elements and then return to your seat. If you need me to come to you, once others have rose to their feet, you may raise your hand and I will come to you. We have options for you to take the bread and the cup separately or in the sealed container together. There's also gluten-free options. As we come to this table today, we come acknowledging the invitation to all people to come to this table no matter what burdens we carry, or no matter what joys we may have today. We're invited to come to this table as a source of thanksgiving and nourishment and satisfaction and preparation, but most importantly, as an opportunity for reconciliation, not only between us and our Savior, but between one another, to acknowledge that as we come to this table, we're not only as the family of God in relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but also we're called to be in relationship with our brothers and sisters who worship here, who worship from home, who worship around the world. And this table is a uniting action to come together and to celebrate. Please join me in prayer. Creator God, we thank you for the invitation to come to this table, to fully live into our identity as disciples of our risen Lord. We thank you that we are welcome here just as all those were welcome the first time Jesus broke bread and shared the cup. We know, Lord, that each one of us is guilty of betraying you, of giving into temptation, of committing many sins. We thank you that this table is a place of reconciliation, of reunion, 
of grace and forgiveness, of acknowledgement of our need for a Savior, and also a place to celebrate and remember with great thanksgiving the amazing sacrifice Jesus made in overcoming death so that each one of us may embrace our identity as beloved and forgiven children and live into the promise of eternal life. We ask as we approach this table that you come near us, allow us to sense the presence of your spirit among us, and may this meal satisfy all that we need to fully live into our identity as your child. We ask this all in the name of Christ. Amen. When Jesus gathered in the upper room with his disciples, after they sang psalms together and said prayers, he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Each time you eat of it, you do so in remembrance of me. It was at that same meal where the disciples had questions and doubts that he poured out the cup. He said, this cup is sealed in my blood as a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink of it, you do so in preparation for my promised return. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. God invites us to come forward and celebrate together. Let us do so. Pray. We 
give thanks for this meal. We give thanks for this opportunity to commune with one another and with our Lord. May all that lies ahead approach us in a way that gives us hope, that fills us with your grace, and that reminds us of the amazing gift of eternal life as we await your promised return. We ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. As a congregation this morning, we come together not only to lift up our voices in song and in study and in reflection, but also in prayer. We want to lift up the concerns and the joys we have together. I want to lift up to you a praise that this is a very full room this morning. So I am grateful that we would, many people noticed that uh, the parking lot was full this morning. Thank you for all being here at the same time. That makes a difference. I also want to lift up a continued prayer request for Conrad Schuler who is now convalescing and recovering at Rydal Park, and he would welcome some brief visits from anyone who would like to stop by. If you'd like more information on how to do that, let me know, and I can coordinate to ensure that you can visit with him, which is a, a simple thing to do right in Jenkintown, but he would appreciate interactions, although brief. So this morning, as we interact with one another in prayer and worship, are there additional prayer requests or updates for us to lift up? Yes, Natalie. My friend texted me one day, that one of her friends, I don't know, like neighbor or something, mm -hmm. her name is Angie, she was hurt by one of her family members and like close like, people and had to go to the hospital and had to talk to the police about it and stuff. So she's only 30 years old, but. We will lift up Angie, who unfortunately was hurt by someone close to her. She recovers and heals with that, of course, thank you. Yes, Karen. Prayers for the family of Joanne Longshore. She was a neighbor of mine and a friend of a few of us here. Mm -hmm. She uh, had Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. and um, passed away yesterday. Mm -hmm. Prayers for those who are mourning the passing of Joanne. Of course. We give thanks for her life. Robin. prayers for peace and the realities of decision making by leaders in this time of warfare of course yes Natalie and we're also um, in seventh, the seventh grade they're getting a new kid named Nicole so yes, prayers Natalie. for her as she like, joins the school year halfway in yes Natalie has continued to be surprised by new students arriving later in the school year so prayers for Nicole as she starts school tomorrow <laughs> Let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you humble that you are willing to hear us and that you're eager to be in relationship with us as we lift up to you things that make us sad as well as things that make us worry, in addition to the things we are grateful for and joyous about. Lord, we lift up before you those who are mourning. We ask that you sustain them and give them hope in this time of grief that they may be able to celebrate their loved one. We lift up before you those who are in need of healing, those who are recovering, those who are dealing with the very real pain and aging of their bodies. May they find hope and comfort in you and being surrounded by those who care for them. Lord, we lift up before you those who've been hurt, those who feel that lives are impacted by threats and danger from others. May they find safety and justice. Lord, we ask to be present with those who are starting new journeys in life, whether it be school or relationships, jobs, travel. Lord, we thank you that our life can change and things can shift. But with every change comes a fear of the unknown. And we ask for your abiding presence in the midst of this disruption. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of this church, for the ways we reach out locally and abroad in your name to be relatable and sharing the good news of salvation. Guide us to work locally in our own households and neighborhoods through this church and through the world through our missionaries to bring the words of love and grace and hope especially into places that are filled with violence and war may we be a presence through the presence of christ to show forth love peace and welcome guide us in the day ahead a day that is filled with business for their church interactions between one another a day that is filled with learnings for our congregation as well as fellowship. May all that we do together today bring honor to you 
and prepare us for the week ahead. We ask this all as disciples whom you taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now, if you're able, to stand with me as we join in singing We Have a Story to Tell the Nations. <laughs> Messiah and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit. Amen. 